When I was a new investor, I focused exclusively on the P.E. ratio when I was analyzing stocks. That single decision caused me to pass on buying some of the greatest growth stocks over the last 20 years. Only later did I learn about a key business attribute that makes the P.E. ratio all but useless when analyzing some stocks. Importantly, once I fully embraced this business concept, I now know when I should use the P.E. ratio and when I should ignore it. So what are we talking about? We'll discuss that next. My name is Brian Feraldi. And my name is Brian Stoffel. Thanks to Quarter for sponsoring today's video. Brian, what is this key attribute that I'm talking about? The attribute that we're talking about today is operating leverage. The simplest way to understand operating leverage is this. It's when a small increase in sales can lead to an outsized increase in profit. Brian, that might sound like magic, but the good news is it's just math. And we can show how this principle works by looking at the income statement. Now, operating leverage affects most parts of the income statement, but we're going to focus specifically on the top half of the income statement. There are two things to understand. The first is the cost of goods sold. That's just how much it costs to make a product. The second are operating expenses. It's another way of saying what it costs to run your business. If you want to learn more about these two costs, check out our deep dive into the income statement. So when a company's revenue is growing, its fixed costs are staying the same. That allows its margins to enhance, which means that its profits can grow at an even faster rate than revenue over time, which is a wonderful factor for investors. All right, Brian, to showcase these principles in action, let's go back to our favorite soul business, Cafe Soleil. All right. So using our farmer's market coffee stand as an example, let's take a look at how we could have some operating leverage. Now, the first thing that we're going to tackle is the cost of goods sold, what it costs to make a cup of coffee. And let's use an example. Let's say that we sell a thousand cups of coffee. All right. To sell a thousand cups of coffee, there's a lot of inputs and it's not just the beans. They're important, but there's the cream, the sugar, the cup cups themselves. And when you add it up, it comes to a dollar per cup it costs us to produce. So if you sold a thousand cups of coffee and you charged $3 per cup, that would give you revenue of $3,000. Taking our dollar per cup cost into consideration, that would cost you $1,000. So your gross profit, 3,000 minus 1,000 equals $2,000. And if you divide gross profit by revenue, that gives you a gross margin of 67%, which is pretty good. So that is is pretty good, but let's amp it up to 5,000 cups. Now, if you commit to selling 5,000 cups of coffee, you will have a lot more buying power with your suppliers. So that will give you the ability to negotiate even lower prices on many of those inputs. This is technically called economies of scale, but it is a key factor that allows companies to increase their profits faster than revenue. That's right. And while we would never do that because we get the coffee beans from a family that we live on the farm with, let's just say we did it across the board and we got a 10% discount on all of them. Then all of a sudden, if you add together all the inputs it takes to make a cup of coffee, we go from it costing a full dollar to just 90 cents. Now that might or might not seem like a big difference, but let's do the math. So you're still selling those 5,000 cups of coffee for $3 each, which gives you $15,000 in revenue. However, because you negotiated a 10% discount on your cost of goods sold, 5,000 times 90 cents is just $4,500. So because of your increased buying power from going from 1,000 cups to 5,000 cups, you were able to lower your cost of goods sold slightly, and that increased your gross margin by 3%. Okay, so we talked about ways that we can get some leverage from the cost of goods sold, but let's investigate operating expenses because that's where the real leverage comes in. As we talked about in our deep dive into the income statement, Cafe Soleil has some fixed operating costs such as insurance, permits, and coffee roaster depreciation. Now, even though you don't pay any of your employees because you're all owners of the business, you still have about $1,000 in operating expenses that you must pay for each and every year. So let's go back to our first example where we sold 1,000 cups and we didn't have any leverage in the cost of goods sold. We had $2,000 in gross profit, but you gotta throw that $1,000 in fixed operating expenses in there, which means that our operating income comes out to $1,000. Divide that 1,000 by revenue revenue of 3,000 and you have operating margin of 33%. That's a really good operating margin in its own right, but let's scale it up to those 5,000 cups of coffee to see what happens. As a reminder, your operating expenses are fixed, so they don't change depending on how many cups of coffee you sold. So we just have to subtract $1,000 for operating costs. If we subtract that from the much higher gross profit of 10,500, that gives up an operating income of $9,500, which is an operating margin of 60 
63%, much, much higher than your old operating margin. All right, to really drive this point home, we can look at the numbers. Our sales increased 5X, but because of operating leverage and economies of scale, our profits increased much faster, nine and a half times. That's operating level. And you can see how powerful this principle can be for investors and businesses. Well, Brian, that was a useful example, but let's use a slightly more complicated company to see how this works in the real world with Tesla. Yeah, what Tesla has done to its financials over the last 10 years showcases operating leverage principle beautifully. Before we did that, we wanted to give a shout out to this video's sponsor, which is Quarter. Quarter's mission is to make every interaction between companies and their investors meaningful. Quarter does so by providing frictionless access to conference calls, investor presentations, transcripts, and earnings reports from markets all around the world straight to your pocket for no cost. If you're interested in giving Quarter a try for free, simply visit the app store of your choice and search for Quarter. That's Q-U-A-R-T-R. -R. Thanks Quarter for sponsoring today's video and for making an awesome product that I love using. So if we rewind the clock to 2012, Tesla did $413 million in sales that year. It cost the company $383 million to produce that revenue. That gave it a gross profit of $30 million, which is a 7% gross margin. That's not that strong. But let's fast forward to the trailing 12 months as of this recording. The company recorded revenue of $47 billion. Now, because of economies of scale, the cost of goods sold was $36 billion, which is much more than in 2012, but less as a percentage of revenue. That leaves us with gross profit of $11 billion. We divide that by our revenue and we see that our gross margin has increased substantially to 23%. Just on the cost of goods sales alone, the company more than doubled its gross margin, which is a huge increase for investors. But we're not done yet. Let's go and add in the operating expenses. Now, automakers have huge fixed costs. It just takes a certain amount of money to operate a factory to produce cars. Because of that, Tesla's operating expenses were much higher than its gross profit. For that reason, the company was actually burning $394 million on an operating basis, which is an operating margin of negative 95% in 2012. However, if we fast forward to today, we can see that operating expenses have increased markedly since 2012, but they are less as a percentage of the gross profit. Today, they are $6 billion, which leaves a positive $5 billion in operating income over the past 12 months. And that gives you an operating margin of 11%, a lot better than negative 95. So between 2012 and 2021, Tesla took advantage of economies of scale and operating leverage, which helps its operating income swing from a huge loss to a huge gain. One way of visualizing where the company was at different stages is that back in 2012, it was roughly here when it comes to operating leverage. But today, Tesla is in a very different state. They've passed the break-even point, and it's more likely that it is here in this stage of development. Well, Brian, valuation is tricky in general, but it can really get tripped up an investor if you start to use the price-to-earnings ratio before operating leverage and economies of scale have kicked in. If you're looking at a company in this stage of its growth, using the P-E ratio will often give you a false signal that the company is way too over overvalued. To see why, let's take a look back at Amazon's operating results during its remarkable run as a public company. These two charts show Amazon's revenue and net income from when it came public through 2016. This is before operating leverage had kicked in. You can see that revenue growth was very stable and very steady. However, you can see that the company's net income was very erratic. Sometimes the company was slightly profitable. Sometimes it actually produced a net loss. That's because the company wasn't yet focused on profitability. For that reason, if you focused on the company's price to earnings ratio during this time period, you would be confused. Sometimes it would be a very high number that was in the multiple hundreds. Sometimes the number would be negative. And yet throughout this whole period, it was a great decision to buy Amazon stock. The PE ratio was very confusing because Amazon was in this phase of its development. In fact, it was going back and forth between stage two and stage three, depending on how much money it was spending. For that reason, the price to earnings ratio was essentially useless. Now let's show how the company has done over the last six years. The company's revenue growth has continued to move higher. However, Amazon has finally started to focus on profitability. And as you can see, the company's profits have exploded higher. That's operating leverage kicking in. So Amazon shifted from being at this phase of the growth development to this phase. That means we're getting closer to that price to earnings ratio being useful. And we can see that if we look at what has happened to this 
company's P.E. ratio over the last five years. While it's still high in absolute terms, it has come down, 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 even though Amazon's price has gone up, up, up. That's because economies of scale and operating leverage were really kicking in, which allowed Amazon's profits to grow much faster than its revenue. Now today, I think you could argue that Amazon is in this phase of its development, so we're not quite to the point yet when the P.E. ratio tells the full story, but we're much closer to the P.E. ratio being a useful figure than we were a few years ago. Yeah, it's only in stage four where it really makes sense to use the P.E. ratio as a valuation metric because the P.E. ratio assumes that a company is optimized for profits and free cash flow. Amazon still isn't there yet, but it is getting closer. On the flip side, if we are looking at a company that's in decline, then the P.E. ratio is useless in the other direction. A stock may look very cheap, but that's because the earnings are high while the share price is going down because Wall Street knows that this business is failing and going towards zero. Don't let that fool you either. That's right. If a company's revenue and profits are both heading towards zero, even if you buy at a P.E. ratio of one, two, or three, you're still going to lose money. Well, we hope you found this video useful. Operating leverage is is a key concept to understand if you're investing, especially in companies that aren't in that fourth stage of growth. Once you learn how to use it, it can help you become a better investor. Brian's out.